technology can be great and sometimes it can be a pain in my ass. So, um, mate, thank, thank you so much for joining the podcast. Harry, I spoke with Harry recently. He's an old colleague of mine, um, and he, he spoke very highly of you as being uh, a savant in this space, <laughs> as being someone who he admires dearly and a whole bunch of other nice things. All the, all the bad things he said off the air, thankfully. So, um, <laughs> no, he, only, only nice things from him. And, and I look up to Harry. So if he looks up to you, um, uh, you must be a pretty incredible founder. Um, I was looking at your LinkedIn. We actually studied engineering around the same time. You were a couple of years ahead of me. I studied biomedical engineering at Sydney University. You studied automation and mechatronics engineering uh, at Canterbury. Mm. Um, I thought I thought that would be the best place to start actually um, here for this conversation. C- could you take me back to your decision to study engineer- engineering, what interested you in it, uh, and why that, you thought that, that was the career path uh, for you? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, so I guess going right back to the start, um, my, my childhood, I, I was always very interested mm. in solving problems. Um, mm. I, I had a fairly unusual upbringing. I was brought up um, in a sort of a rural area, so I was homeschooled for a lot of my childhood, my early childhood. Um, mm. And during that period, I spent a huge amount of time fixing things. I would build go-karts, I would fix cars. Um, and when I was very young, I started a, a business repairing electronics um Mm. and so i guess i always knew i wanted to to solve problems that's really what got me up in the morning Um, and i think engineering was just a natural extension there i mean that was really it was it was fairly obvious to Mm. me that i wanted to do that um and Mm. then obviously did did your parents uh did, did your parents have any uh inspiration in in that i mean being homeschooled they would have had a pretty big factor in the way you spent your free time what how, what part did they play in, the, in that process that's certainly certainly they did um my dad's a very interesting guy he he's a school teacher and a farmer which doesn't doesn't sound super glamorous <laughs> um <laughs> but he he fixes everything he builds everything himself um I spent probably four or five years building our house with him. Um, so he would do that yeah. after work every day yeah. and I'd spend three or four hours with him like five, six days a week, just building that house. Um, wow. uh, and then he also obviously had a workshop and so I would spend a lot of time in there mm. just fixing things. So, yeah. Yeah. Uh, my dad, similar, um, interesting background. He's a, he's a leather craftsman. Um, and, so I'd always see him around the house building things with his hands. And, uh, he did that from basically when I was born, he came from Italy over here, uh, to do that. So that, that similar to you is that sort of spark of inspiration that you can create something from scratch, um, and, and take that and build that into something, uh, that is useful. Um, in building the the house, how was that as a child? Was that, were those grueling days? <laughs> uh, it, it was, the expectations were high. Um, considering it's just him and I mm. building it, but it was <laughs> it it was it was enjoyable. It certainly taught you to to think mm. probably a bit more like an adult from a younger age. Um, you, mm. you you learned how to solve your own problems just to a certain extent, um, mm. and it definitely taught you to to persevere. You know, I remember being out there um, yep. at, at one a.m. on the morning and a like <laughs> before before rain or before snow to, to pour a concrete pad you know th- th- those types of things yeah. were weren't yeah. fun at the time but looking back like they're great memories awesome experience i can't say i had the same experience as that uh, as that um but i definitely helped him around the uh the workshop which was awesome so you were at high school oh actually i'm curious how long were you homeschooled for was that up until uh high school and then you moved into more formal education or was it how did that work yeah um, I was actually homeschooled right up until year 13. I only did one year at high school. Um, so I, awesome. Yeah. 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 As I said, it was a, it was a different, very different upbringing. Um, I, mm. I didn't, I, I didn't have a, a very, um, analytical education up until high school. Mm. I, I, mm. I, I done a lot of project based work. You know, I could, I could fix things. I could 
I could pretty much work on my own, but mm. I, you know, I hadn't, I hadn't done any algebra. Um, mm. So that's, so that's interesting. Yeah. That, that, so going into engineering, well, it, it either would have been a shock to you or it would have come to you very easily. And I'm curious if you hadn't studied uh, sort of basics of mathematics as you move into sort of uh, the engineering school, firstly, what does that transition look like and how did you make that transition? How did you upskill to get to that, to that requisite level of learning? Because I found it difficult having studied physics and mathematics at high school. I still found it hard, so I can only imagine um, that that transition would have been difficult. So how did you do that? It was, it was a difficult transition. Um, the, the high school part was hard for me. So I did the one year of high school where I, I pretty much spent the first half of the year studying or the year sort of to the two years prior. So that would be year 11 and year 12 math and physics. Uh, and then the last six months of the year doing year 13. So mm. it was pretty much just a very, a, a very aggressive one year of, of high school, um, where again, I would just, I just switched into study mode and I would, I would come home and I would study till late at night and then go back to school and mm. kind of ask, ask anything that I didn't know, fill any gaps in my knowledge. Um, mm. and actually by the time I got to the end of year 13, um, I was, I was fine. I did, I did pretty well. You were fine. So you picked, you picked it up all pretty quickly by the sounds of things. <laughs> It, it, yeah, I mean, I was definitely working working harder than most other students were in year thirteen because it was mm. uh, I had nothing to compare it to. But first year uni mm. was easier than my year thirteen. Oh, really? So, was engineering your top priority, um, or did you have other other things in the mix there um, as options as you had headed into uni? Um, interesting question. So, I did. I had a lot of other things going on at, at, at the same time. Interestingly enough, I didn't think I would be very employable. <laughs> um, mm. So I always saw university as a way to learn. And that was, that was it. I, um, I didn't mm. see a lot of value in getting good grades. I didn't study things mm. that I, I, I didn't, I, I thought had absolutely no value. I just wanted to learn as mm. much as I could to set myself up well later on. So I had, I had various businesses throughout uni. Um, first year uni, I had a, uh, a web development company, which we built like an abstraction for building shops, actually similar to Shopify, mm. but for Shopify, um, and very, very mm. rudimentary. Um, mm. that was my first year, second year uni, I, um, I decided to build caravans. So I built a built a caravan uh, that was going to be like a an MVP. Um, mm. and, you know, I ended up only building one because it was a lot harder than I thought it was. Um, and it's, mm. it, it took me six months to build. Um, so I lived in that third year. I did an architectural balustrade business, um, mm. which was actually quite successful. I, um, sort of, we made a bit over a hundred grand profit in, in that, in that one year. And then fourth year, I was actually working at Rocket Lab full time as well, alongside uni. So mm. it kind of, I, I always had something, something alongside uni. Just for that first year project, you mentioned that it was sort of an abstraction uh, for building sort of online shops. Are, are you naturally inclined as a as like a developer, as a programmer, or was this something that you kind of you teed, you worked together with other people who had the requisite skill sets? Uh, um, I'm curious how you went around what about building these things? Um, no, th those phases it was all myself. So I, um, I just taught myself to code at the time. Mm. Um, it wasn't very good. It certainly in hindsight, mm. it was, it was terrible, but it was enough to, to build a working prototype and something that was kind of usable. Mm. The one thing I'm interested in here is like, you know, you're going from, year 13 and not having spent time in school and learning like sort of analytical subjects and then here you're going into uni and then learning how to code. What, what do you, I mean, how do you view like self-learning, self-education and how do you do it? Um, I'm curious to know like what the sources of learning 
you use are the, the most popular sources of learning you look to um, in order to upskill and how you structure your day around around picking up those skills? Mm. So I think one of the most valuable aspects of my my education, or certainly homeschooling, was project based learning. Um, mm. It wasn't intentional. I didn't realize it at the time. But looking back, there was enormous value to starting something from scratch, working on it to completion, and then having something to show for it. Um, mm. I still use that in almost, it, I think that's a, that's a huge part of the way I operate now. I, I, I love solving hard problems and I like working mm. through from start to finish. So understanding all of the, the, the fundamentals, all of the first principles, thinking through how a problem should be solved, learning everything I need to learn to solve that problem, and then applying everything mm. I've learned to, to some outcome. And mm. I think, uh, again, it wasn't intentional uh, in, in my sort of early education, but it really set me up well because going through uni, I kind of had the same approach. I would, I would focus on the projects, particularly, or the practical applications of what we were learning, and then I would really understand it from first principles, which generally mm. meant I could do quite well, not top of the class, but you know, reasonably well without having to study a lot, just learning things from first principles. Um, and it carried through very well to to work, say to, to to Rocket Lab or to the to the businesses. Can Can you give an example of learning something from first principles? Something that you know, maybe back then or maybe recently that you look to and think, right? Like, I'm glad that I un you know unpacked that that learning um, from the ground up. And and um, yeah, I'm just curious to know what what's an example of that that's worked for you. So. Yeah, in in recent memory. Yeah. So in recent memory, if I think back to say hard problems building say like a simulator, a, a, an orbital simulator at Rocket Lab, you if if you sat down and tried to learn everything about simulators and, and aerospace and read all NASA's papers on on, on orbital simulators or hardware and lip simulators you would, very little of it would stick and you wouldn't ever practically finish. So I think a really good example of first principles learning there is thinking about the, the problem we've got to solve. So that's reliability, right? We need to simulate a rocket so that the, the rocket itself, we're confident that the real rocket will make it to orbit, it'll deploy its payloads and the, the mission will be a success. Now, how do we how do we work back from that? Which problems do we need to solve? What are the easy problems? What are the hard problems? And so in that case, the hard problems were all around signal processing and control systems, guidance systems. Those were the hard problems. And so you'd sort of just learn learn enough about those to to know where it was likely to fail. And then move on to learning mm. a, a bit about how, what the inputs and outputs to a rocket look like. How how does, uh, how does the the rocket respond to certain inputs and how does it respond to certain outputs? And you can kind of mm. you kind of just iteratively break down the problem to the point where you understand all of the key parts of the system from first principles. Then you can reason about it from first principles as well, or you can go, well, this is, th these are the inputs, these are the outputs, here is the, the high level goal. This is where I really need to go deep. And then I'll go and, and read the theory on, on various parts of, you know, mm -hmm. aspects of signal processing, because you're learning, you're learning in the most efficient way possible. Um, the added, side effect or the added benefit there is you're generally learning, you, you generally remember almost 100% of what you learn because you you have to to mm. tie it back to, to whatever you're working on. So yeah, so a, a mm. bit, bit of a boast, but that was, that would be my summary. No, I'm, I mean, that's a, it's an awesome way for you to break the, 
that down. Um, and when you're learning these new subjects, for example, and we'll we'll touch on your your time at at Rocket Lab. Um, are you going then to uh, textbooks? Are you going to YouTube? Are you talking to uh, experts in the field? How how do you arm yourself with the re with the re relevant knowledge to tackle that problem to the degree you need to solve it? Rather than like you know overextending yourself and and going too deep and, and these these topics control systems and digital signal processing are such so deep and so wide you could end up in a in a place you don't want to end up and um, those were some of the hardest harder subjects that I that I studied and I don't I don't um, envy the position that you're in to, to do that but where are you um, capturing your information uh, in order to solve those problems? So it's a combination of online. Uh, there are surprisingly good YouTube uh, content creators, uh, even for really technical subjects um, like, like Khan Academy. Mm -hmm. There's there are really good blogs written by other engineers. Um, you can find a lot of this, or I find a lot of this on say like Hacker News, like the Y Combinator blogs. There's, there's actually a lot of really mm -hmm. good content there. Um, on the list deeply technical side of things. There are a lot of podcasts I'll listen to sort of on the strategic high level side of things, less so mm -hmm. as a peer engineer, more so now. Talking to other engineers, just um, uh, asking really senior engineers a lot of questions. Um, I think the first mm -hmm. year at Rocket Lab, I was constantly asking, asking questions um, to the point where it was a bit annoying, mm -hmm. but that that was also really valuable and you would often find mm. other weird blogs that no one's ever heard of um, just in most conversations mm. um so you finished or you, you you worked on those three different startups or four different startups throughout uni you then had to make a leap into um like full-time work or part-time work uh what was your first job out of uni uh that that related to what you studied so my first job out of uni was Rocket Lab. I mm -hmm. I joined actually I was still at uni while I was working at Rocket Lab, so I, I joined in my fourth year, mm -hmm. um, and that was as an engineer mm -hmm. building the hardware simulator, um, and that was directly related to my. Can you could could you explain uh, for those listening and to myself what that is? Absolutely, Hard, the hardware in the loop simulator is a it's a big piece of hardware that's used to test the launch vehicle before before it's before it's launched typically before it's ever flown is where it's at the most value so mm. all all decent rocket companies will, will have this and you can think of it as a way of tricking the rocket into thinking certain things are happening. So you, you might mm. take a sensor that would normally, let's say, um, be like a GPS and the, mm. all of the rocket's software and hardware is expecting a GPS. Instead of plugging a GPS into it, you plug a fake GPS in and then you simulate mm. the, you know, you simulate it flying to orbit. You can simulate it moving around randomly and you just test how the actual rocket behaves in all those different scenarios. If you, mm. if you take that concept and scale it up, so you're simulating the GPS, you're simulating all of the pressure sensors, uh, kind of all of the inputs to, to a rocket, that's your mm. hardware in the loop. And you can actually get to the point where you fly the entire rocket to orbit and all parts mm. of the system think that, think that it's a real rocket and it thinks that it's flying to orbit. And that's because you're, you're tricking mm. all the sensors at the right times. Uh, that's, mm. that's a hardware in the loop. So are you guys um, primarily software business or is it software and hardware mix? Do you guys manufacture that, that piece of hardware in Australia uh, and then sell that to, to uh, you know, SpaceX, say, or, or uh, other uh, aircraft businesses? At Rocket Lab? Hmm. Uh, it's, it's just built in-house for, for Rocket Lab's rockets. Um, it's just right just purely used for those. Yep, purely for. Okay, awesome. Um, so, what 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 is the overarching Rocket Lab business do? Because I, I I might just Google them now. 
if you could just des- describe what Rocket Lab does beyond beyond the um, that piece of hardware. Yeah, so Rocket Lab Rocket Lab build rockets. Um, they we were the we were the second private company in the world to put something into space. Um, mm. Obviously, first it was SpaceX, second was us. We were seventh country mm. in the world to make it to space. Um, it's mostly focused on the CubeSat microsat market. Um, so that's mm. smaller satellites that something like SpaceX or NASA wouldn't launch. Um, mm. And they, Rocket Lab built a, built a small launch vehicle called Electron and launches up to about 150 kgs into low Earth orbit. Mm. So, uh, what, what are the what are the benefits of the the microsat sats? Are they for uh, tracking, or are they purely for hobbyists? And oh, I assume it's too expensive for, to launch 150 kg into orbit for a hobbyist. But um, what what are they? What's the use case for those those types of satellites? Th- th- there's a there's a lot of use cases. Satellites technology electronics are getting smaller and smaller, and the the mm. amount of sensors you can pack into a small space is getting better and better so they mm. use them they, they use them for all sorts of things uh, it can be earth earth imaging it can be crop monitoring uh, you can do things like monitoring just like like ships act, activity mm. um, they use them for measuring say the magnetic field of the earth um, mm. there's there's a whole yeah, there's a whole range of things a whole bunch of stuff now right um after after rocket lab you guys well you you in particular went off and start another business i believe called all goods is that the have i got the chronology right yep that's exactly can you right. can you just yeah it's good i, I did my google's a uh, google's great at that so <laughs> done it's done half the work for me um can you just can you describe all goods um and what you know was and ex, ex, describe to me the, the genesis story for that um, as you left Rocket Lab, maybe it was at the same time. Um, I'm keen to know how that got started and why you thought that was something you should dedicate your time on. So, all, all goods was something I'd been thinking about for a long time. Um, it was kind of an iteration on that very early project I had around storefronts uh, and, and selling selling things online or simplifying it. It was designed to be a more more of a platform to allow SMBs to sell online easily. And uh, to, to be honest, we probably, we started off with very, very green. The other startups that I'd had were just me and were very um, small scale compared to this. But mm. conceptually, we wanted to make it really easy for SMBs to get online and then sell their their products through through multiple different channels. We mm. we market it as a as a classified marketplace to drive buyers, um, mm. which didn't end up working that well. It ended up looking like a direct competitor to the local marketplace trade me. Um, mm. But over about two two and a half years, we had over but over a thousand paying uh, or over a thousand business customers uh, and about four hundred thousand users so it did, wow. did reasonably well yeah um did you guys raise capital to drive that growth or was this done sort of bootstrapped through those paying customers it was it was mostly bootstrapped so i was still contracting to rocket lab um most of it was just being funded by myself we did raise a little bit of money from a, a single angel investor but outside of that mm. i I funded it. Um, I had I had a bit over a hundred thousand dollars from the previous business I mentioned, um, and so I was able to put that mm. in early on as well. And that that got us mm. through the first first year. Yeah. H- how did you view, you know, customer acquisition on that? You, you mentioned four hundred thousand users, and I assume this was targeted towards the New Zealand market primarily. Um, correct me if I'm wrong. Um, how did you go from sort of the more technical side building rockets to you know more marketing focused business uh and that customer acquisition funnel how how did you view that change and and what did you actually do in order to get those numbers up 
yeah, oh, I could I could talk for more than an hour about all of the different uh, user acquisition strategies we tried. Go for it. <laughs> Go. For, you you give me give me your top you give me your top uh, three uh, after you give me the little spiel. <laughs> top three. Um, well, to start off with, it was a huge change going from Rocket Lab to to this consumer facing thing where decisions were a lot more emotional. You had to try and understand user behavior. Um, things that were most similar was data. Both of them are heavily reliant on data. Um, and we came into it really tracking a lot of things and, and just constantly studying the data to try and figure out what was going on. That was a really good approach in hindsight. In, in terms of the different techniques that we use to acquire customers, we we used a lot of viral loops. So um, for businesses, if they brought on their existing customers, we would give them huge discounts. That that was quite effective actually. And we built tools to make that really easy as in they could click one button and invite them all. The mm. those, those viral loops we used for users themselves as well. So you could, when you signed up, you could invite your friends and, and get credit. And that would, mm. um, in and of itself, wasn't a particularly amazing idea, but we made it super easy. So you could click one button and it would scan your, your Gmail, it would scan your contacts and it would suggest 500 mm. people to invite. And then what you had to do is just click invite and it would send them a little mm. message saying X person is is, uh, has invited you to join this platform. Uh, and a lot of the, a lot of the loops there were quite optimized and actually worked really well at, at, um, mm. once they were optimized, it was, um, it, yeah, it, it was quite good. And other things that were quite effective was, um, getting talked about on certain seller forums. This wasn't intentional, but seller forums turned out to be a really good way for us to drive the sellers themselves, which in turn brought on a lot of buyers, particularly if we could incentivize the sellers mm. to bring on the buyers. Um, so they were mm. often sellers were bringing across their own buyers from other platforms. Mm. Awesome. Um, and that, that got you to 400 K. I, I presume you, you guys had a paid marketing program, um, or is this purely done through organic means? It was mostly organic actually. Um, we did a little mm. bit of advertising, but mm. it was mostly organic because, because we had these sellers, you know, thousand odd sellers, we were able to do a lot of SEO hacks to, to rank as well. Um, mm. again, incentivizing sellers to redirect to us. It's, I think it's harder to do that now, but about three, four years ago, there were still some, there were still some SEO hacks that were, that were left. Mm. Um, can you explain how you guys transitioned from all goods? Well, I, from what I understand, all goods was kind of a precursor to what you're working on now. Um, can you explain how all goods tape it off? I mean, I, I don't know what the, what happened towards the end, whether you guys sold it or whether you, it's still running now or shut down or so you explain what happened there and then how this kind of led into, uh, partly and what you guys are doing with partly. And then we can explore that area. Cause that's a super interesting industry in and of itself, but I am interested in how all goods kind of tape it off and then how partly was sort of born of that, um, that business. Yeah. So. Or while we were running all goods, we were constantly looking at the data, as I mentioned earlier. Now, data data is very interesting when you when you start to analyze how different categories are structured, where buyers are coming from, how how much the average order order value is, those types of things. And we noticed that automotive parts were three or four times more likely to be found by organic SEO 
over eighty mm. percent of our purchases were coming from outside of New Zealand versus say electronics, which was less than twenty percent, like a huge difference, almost five times more offshore purchases. And the sellers of auto parts really struggled to get their parts online because linking a part to the right vehicle is a is another really difficult problem. It's probably harder than all of the other problems combined in that one part mm. fits a very specific vehicle. If you want a headlight, you can only find a headlight that fits your your car. So mm. we kind of noticed all of these stats um, where auto parts was very clearly something we needed to spend more time on. Now, over the two and a half, three years that we were working on all goods, we'd also realized that we were never going to do our life's work just focusing on New Zealand. It's a small country and software software works much better at scale. You can put in a similar amount of work for New Zealand and it'll work globally if the problem is a global problem. And we realized we weren't really focusing on a global problem. We're focusing on a local problem. So it was the combination of looking at the problem that our customers were facing, studying the data, and really wanting to do something a lot bigger that led us to the decision mm. to to shut down all goods now that was a remarkably difficult decision because at the time it wasn't it wasn't a failing business it was just it just wasn't wildly successful it was kind of this moderately successful business you could probably pay a few staff it would grow moderately mm. it'd always be fighting competing it was a very competitive space um but it, it always felt like we were we were just one growth hack away from from going exponential um so it was a very difficult mm. decision to to shut that down to give up the all the potential that it had and then try something completely new and unproven but ultimately we decided it was the mm. right move because of the global potential we were confident enough at that point in the customer problem it was a very deep and painful problem mm. and so we ended up just uh, shutting down all goods and we're pretty much starting from scratch with with partly. Mm. Well, how does that conversation go down with your co-founder and team? <laughs> well, there were there were certainly how does that happen? <laughs> there, there were some heated debates. We mm. we spent over a month just debating this internally before we, we did anything. Um, There's certainly a lot of pushback from the team, but ultimately after we discussed this for, yeah, it was over a month, four or five weeks, we all, we all came to the same conclusion based on the data. It was very clear this was a big problem. It was very clear that we were gonna be fighting with this moderately successful business for a long time. Mm. Um, and I think people believed in the believed in the vision enough to to jump on board. Mm. With the all goods business, and you guys shut that down. Um, was there an opportunity for you guys to kind of spin something off, or do it as a side project, or did you feel that this was something that had to have its sort of full attention, um, not kind of half hearted? Um, is that is that the way you felt? Yes, there was a lot of talk about running it alongside partly or um, selling it and uh, mm. bringing on someone else to run the business. We had a lot of these conversations, but ultimately we decided that our biggest advantage as a startup was our focus. And if we mm. sold it, there's a huge overhead, there's due diligence. We would need to be supporting the code mm. base because we wrote the entire thing from scratch. Um, mm. you know, we didn't think the odds of them succeeding were very high given we knew everything about it and it was still very difficult. And so mm. we considered all those options and ultimately decided just to be ruthless, um, mm. brutally intellectually honest and say, shut the entire thing down quickly, quickly and efficiently, and then focus all of our attention on, on this much larger goal. Mm. Did, did you already have what the product, the, the first iteration of the product should look like, or were you kind of in ideation phase 
um, upon exiting all goods? We we didn't have anything at that point. Um, we weren't even, I don't even think we were really even in ideation phase. We were just, we knew that there was a problem. We had, mm. we knew that it was a, we knew it was a really deep, fundamental, painful customer problem. They were all asking mm. if, if we could solve it. They were willing to pay for it. Um, and it was clear that it wasn't just a, it wasn't a small problem that they'd pay a small amount to solve. If we could solve this problem, it was the, kind of the holy grail of of the, mm. the auto parts industry, um, or, or sooner you, uh, mm. um, e-commerce. Mm. How did those months, you know, what did those months look like? So you shut, shut it down, um, you, you gather the team together, you refocus, you regroup, you set the new North Star, which is we're going to solve this enormous multi hundred billion trillion dollar industry problem. Can you take me into like the board meeting room or into the, into the, uh, the war room? What did you guys do to, un to find what this solution was? What was the mindset and how did you do that? How did you uncover that, those problems? Who did you speak to? I'm keen to know the details. Yeah. So first off, we, we took the problem. We just broke it down by first principles. Um, we said, here is, here is the data. This is what customers are very clearly struggling with. Why are they struggling with this? Why hasn't this been solved yet? Is there a, is there a simple solution? What's the MVP? And then we went off and talked to customers about their thesis. So we, we, we built this, this mental model that said, this is the problem that they're having. And, and this is the data surrounding it. Now let's go off and talk to some actual customers or some of these businesses. Who, who are the, who, who are the customers and or businesses? You know, what, what do they look like? It was a combination. So there were local businesses like, um, Canterbury, Canterbury cut parts, which is just a mm. uh, dismantling group. Uh, there was like mag, mag warehouse, which were a well entire distributor that we went in and talked to. There were a handful of existing of old all goods customers that we reached out to who had who'd been selling parts or wanted to sell parts. Um, and we just sat down and, and interviewed them really to why haven't you done this before? Show me how you do it. We watched them trying to list parts, trying to add compatibility. Um, and off the back of those conversations, we were able to build quite an accurate picture and spot really clear patterns in the problems that we're having. Mm -mm. What did that first iteration end up looking like? What were, what were the problem problem areas like that, that, that you found were most common? If you don't mind me asking. No, no, not, not at all. The, uh, the first iteration was, was very MVP, but the, the common theme was linking parts and vehicles, which we call co vehicle compatibility or vehicle fitment. So that was when they were selling a part, they needed to say, they need to list out all the different vehicles that fit. On average, a part could fit over a hundred different vehicles. It's very hard to list that one by one. Then on the buyer side, we found that buyers couldn't find parts. They didn't know if it would fit. Mm. And so the buyer needed to find and input their vehicle and filter parts by vehicles. And it was creating that link between parts and vehicles mm. that they universally struggled with. And there was, there was very little information online. There weren't really any systems online to do that. There was some offline kind of catalog base that have, have a book that look in mm. um, where the, the manufacturers would make these books, but it was really clear that that was the, the key problem that needed to be solved. Structure the vehicles, structure the parts, link them together, and then connect them mm. by that link. And this, this, this system that you're building presumably go, can go way, well beyond vehicles because this is just about fitments. So provided that there's enough liquidity in the market or enough supply and demand for those parts across the buyer and the seller, you could move into, I mean, you could move horizontally into a range of different, uh, area areas. Um, is that something that you guys are looking at? Like is or vehicles right now is really just your, um, your sort of bread and butter. It's something we will most likely do in future because you're right. It's a, mm. it's a fundamental problem that exists across anything. Re relating to replacement parts. Um, if you need to know what it fits, 
you have the same problem. And that applies across all sorts of categories, commercial vehicles, that applies to the construction, it applies to anything repair related, componentry. Mm. Um, right now, the problem with an automotive is so huge. We could work on this for the next five years and maintain a mm. 500% annual growth rate. Like it would just, you could, <laughs> you could do it's this. Huge. For, it's enormous. Yeah, it, it is enormous. The, the, the long-term goal is to, is to be the supporting infrastructure for all replacement parts. Um, mm. Can, can you talk about the size of this, this industry just generally? Cause I'm curious to know how, how big you estimate this to be and the kinds of, I mean, the kinds of relationships that you'll build as part of this, like who, who those target customers are, whether it's, um, you know, Joe Bloggs, uh, auto parts on the, on, on the street corner, or it's these sort of bigger players who are willing to pay you big, big money to solve this inefficiency. Um, firstly, how, how, how big is this industry? It's, it's a huge industry. So automotive parts are about a $1.9 trillion industry, $1.9 trillion US dollar industry. So that's mm. yeah, close to $2 trillion US dollars are spent every year just on the auto parts. If you, mm. if you break that out into componentry and replace the parts in general, you're starting to pull numbers out of thin air because it can... If you if you include all replacement parts, you know you're ten percent plus of the global GDP. So it's, it's just it's a nonsensical mm. number. <laughs> um, mm. But certainly, in terms of the the, the, the practical sales addressable market, it is mm. it is in the it is in the trillions. Mm. The, the target audience is on, so the target customers on your, on your, uh, in front of you right now, who, who are those customers and are they cust are they people or businesses that we know of, um, or are they more hidden, hidden in the weeds, but they're enormous, presumably. Yeah. The, the customer profiles range a lot for us. We do have a large number of enterprise customers. Um, a lot of which you probably have heard of like eBay. Um, eBay are one of oh, our, yeah. they're not our largest, but they're one of our larger paying customers. Um, mm. OLX or NASPERS, which you would have heard of if you, if you live in Europe. Um, mm. These are sort of the bigger, the bigger customers. Now they obviously pay quite a lot and we help them structure their data, provide this buyer and seller link. We do also work with the smaller sort of SMB mid-market and those are your your smaller distributors and manufacturers. Um, the two mm. kind of go hand in hand. We end up helping distributors and manufacturers sell through any mm. online means. In which case, you kind of need both sides of both sides of the the network to make the whole system work. Mm. So the the bigger customers are certainly big marketplaces and, and our enterprise, and they generate probably the over over half of our revenue. And then there's a large number of smaller businesses that'll be paying monthly in a transaction fee. Mm. Um, I'm curious to know, you know, it seems like just from what you've told me, you know, you're, you're very much an in the weeds kind of guy. You'd love to get your hands dirty, even from a young age. Now that you're sort of operating this at a higher level of it, you're still, you guys are still, you know, early stage. So it means you can still fortunately get your hands in the, in the, in the weeds and get them dirty. How have you viewed though, the transition between being on the ground to being like a higher level sort of manager leader, um, in, in the company? Uh, it's, it's an excellent question. I, I struggle with it a lot. Um, I am an engineer originally, and as I mentioned, I, I, I like solving hard problems. So when when I can't solve these hard problems, uh, I, I do I do find it difficult to pass this over. Now, the the transition I think has gone well in that there's still a lot of very difficult problems to solve at scale. They just change. The problems we're solving now are operational, uh, organizational structure. It's it's ne complex negotiations. It's strategy. And you can still frame them in the same basic way. 
what are the what are the inputs what are the outputs just translate to what do i need to do what do the team need to do and what are the outcomes that we want to see as a company and i i really enjoy now structuring the the company or building a company in the same way that i would build something technical like we're building a company very intentionally we're building a culture very intentionally there's there's people dynamics that are actually very very interesting and the same goes for for our customers our go-to-market strategy it's very intentional we look at the data we can go here are all the players in the market this is how this decision is likely to influence this group and i've I've got used to the idea that I'm not going to be writing much code and <laughs> I, uh, I try and have the more operational people in the business take care of the operational aspects of the business. I very intentionally avoid, avoid that, but focus a lot of my time on the harder business problems, the core strategy long-term and the overall company building. How are we going to scale this company? How are we going to scale it so mm. the whole team are excited, happy, they, they're they they're pumped to be on this mission. Um, mm. And that, that really excites me. I, I, I find that really genuinely exciting. Mm. You, you mentioned um, being intentional with your decision making. Can you explain, you know, what that means uh, and how you do it? You know, how do you be intentional about um, making these decisions, be it in technical quantitative areas or something that's a little bit more like qualitative or harder to define, you know, culture, for instance? Yeah, definitely. Um, it's a good question because it it isn't as obvious as it sounds. Early on in the business, a lot of our decisions were, were unintentional. And it sounds a bit strange, but that was really, we would make quick, very quick decisions based on a small amount of data and a kind of a, a gut feel. Now, at an early stage in the business, that makes sense because you can iterate very quickly. But at a little, you know, once the, the business grows a little bit bigger, I found you, you can't make decisions as quickly and it's much better to be intentional in that you, you make the decision mentally you then write down or play out all of the consequences. What are the, what is the impact this is going to have on, on our business? What is the one year impact? What's the three year? What's the 10 year impact? And just stopping for long enough to play out all of those different scenarios makes decisions a lot clearer. There are a lot of decisions I don't make now, or I wouldn't make just because I've played out these scenarios and they're not accurate. Mm. but they're accurate enough to give you some sense of the side effects. And so I think mm. that's, that becomes increasingly important. The larger the business is really just mm. trying to understand the impact of these decisions before you actually make them. Mm. Being, being kind of like directionally correct, just being in the, in the ballpark, the, the error bars are so large. Yeah. <laughs> you can't predict the future. If you could, then you wouldn't be doing what you're doing, but, um, I, I, I try to employ like a, a similar tactic and sometimes it can fry your brain trying to think up all these scenarios. But, um, and it's why I asked you like, what, what, how do you view sort of these intentional decision makings? Now I find it harder to do it on things that are intangible, um, things that are more, you know, like you mentioned, people dynamics, culture, like all these things way harder to do it on. Um, uh, but it'll be interesting to, to, uh, to get that experience from your, your perspective as you grow partly it's it's and it's growing quite fast um, by the sounds of things I've got a couple of um, sort of like uh, questions here that unrelated to what we've previously spoken about but some of them are short some of them are long and so you can just fill in the fill in the blank okay. um, what what advice would you give uh, a 20 something year old uh, prior to starting their own venture and or business take take as much risk as you can um mm. I, I generally find a, a surprisingly 
a surprisingly high number of people that are very risk adverse, even when they're young. It doesn't make any mm. sense to be risk adverse when you're young. Um, yeah, I, I mean, I, I think that's probably one of the biggest reasons why we've mm. we've succeeded. Why I've, I've been able to do the, do the things that we have so far is just taking a lot of risk, mm. more risk than you're comfortable with. What what, what it what, what does it mean to take a lot of risk in your mind? Is it financial? Is it about the roles you take it, you know, instead of interning at some, you know, engineering school, maybe you start your own thing. What, what, what does it mean to be risk averse in your book? To me, it, it, it's very general. It applies quite generally. So it could be quit, quit your, your job and, and, and try something new that, that's an example of something that's high risk, and you can kind of evaluate that depending on the situation you're in. If you've got a if you've got a family that you need to support, then that would probably be too high risk. But there are also other things, you know, even within the role, you can you can do low risk things or high risk things, and mm. or always optimizing for the higher risk thing. It usually has a higher reward, not always, but um, high risk, high reward. That. That definitely applies if you're a early stage startup founder as well. Hmm. Really, you can't, you won't survive unless you do take a lot of risk because generally when things play out, thing, you know, when you think something's high risk, it doesn't turn out to be as bad. Even when things fail, they don't usually fail in catastrophic ways. Um, and so hmm. it's, it's more an attitude that I think is, is critical if you if you want to mm. really succeed yeah um who do you think of when you hear the word successful <laughs> and it could be by the way it doesn't have to be a business person it doesn't have to be it could be anything it could be you know maybe you like music and it's a musician or it's an actor or or it's maybe it is a business person or an engineer someone close to you someone famous it doesn't have to fit any particular mold Interestingly, the first person that came to mind was, well, it was actually two people simultaneously, which was the Colson brothers from Stripe. Um, mm. I'm not quite sure why that popped into my head first mm. when you said successful. I do think of them as very successful people. Mm. Uh, Patrick Colson and Stripe are, I think, a very, very interesting company, and mm. their approach has been super interesting, so obviously quite um, aligned with their success. The other person that jumps to mind is actually Bill Gates, not so much for, mm. for his business success, Microsoft, but also for his all of his uh, efforts when it comes to philanthropy. I think, I, mm. I think, I, I really admire that attitude, and I think that would that would be something I would like to, uh, I would like to spend more time thinking about later on in life. Uh, so, yeah, mm. two great. Uh, choices i follow uh one of the collison brothers on uh on twitter uh and he's incredibly smart um and i've kind of been following them since well actually i, I don't know if you you're on twitter but there was a, a uh, an article that came out by a stripe competitor called bolt did you did you hear this controversy no see this controversy I didn't. uh well, well I'll, I'll send i'll send it to you afterwards it was basically this guy who was the founder of bolt who it's a um competitor to stripe saying that Stripe and Y Combinator, this is completely unfounded, by the way, were like the mob of Silicon Valley and <laughs> blocking out, you know, other payments providers and all this sort of stuff. And I just thought it was hilarious. So I'll, I'll send you that after this. Um, the last one, <laughs> it's, a, it's a pretty funny one because they, they seem like such lovely guys as well. Um, last one here, and this is taken from uh, Tim Ferriss, uh, who I've, I've got one of his books and he, he always asks this question and I, and I, I love this question. Um, what is your favorite failure? And what I mean by that is how has an apparent failure set you up for success down the line? Mm. Very interesting question. My favorite failure is probably, actually it's probably the consecutive failure failures of, of my previous businesses. Um, the, the most obvious is probably the that we would find company I had and the way that that failed just understanding understanding you can put an enormous amount of time and effort into something 
and if the direction is wrong it, it'll still fail um that probably changed my perspective f- fundamentally um mm. yeah mm. levi man it was awesome to to talk with you um i'm so glad harry uh connected us you're, you're doing some awesome things with partly is there anything that you want to send people to a link um a, a youtube video a blog or any parting words um that you'd like to share well no, I, I really appreciate it the the only thing i always like to say is part, partly a partly a hiring we're always looking for exceptional people mm-hmm. we have very very difficult problems mm-hmm. to solve trying to trying to build this global business um so mm-hmm. if if there's any exceptional engineers particularly engineers listening then yeah very very keen to talk awesome 